so we will wait for two more minutes and then we will start sir okay okay So I think we will start. Okay. <coughs> so, hello and good evening, everyone. Welcome to the CPPR web series organized by the Center for Public Policy Research, Kochi. CPPR, as you know, is a public policy think tank located in Kochi, Kerala, engaging in a range of sectors like urban governance, education, livelihood, governance, security, and IR. We have been a pivotal partner in furthering engagements with governments and diplomats of various nations. To know further about what we do, please do visit our website www.cppr.in and our social media accounts. Today, we are going to discuss one of the significant topics that can have major geopolitical implications for the years to come. In today's webinar, we are here to discuss the implications of Chinese Communist Party's 20th National Congress. And I am Anirudh Prem, an IR researcher at CPPR. Today, we have with us Mr. Murlidharan Nair, a senior fellow with CPPR, and who is also a prominent researcher in Chinese studies. Murlidharan Nair has completed his studies at University of Kerala, and after that, he did a postgraduate program in marketing and advertising from Bhavan's Rajendra Prasad Institute of Communication and Management, Mumbai. He has held various positions in the government and abroad. Go besides publishing research papers in various books and journals, Mr. Nair has written commentaries in newspapers and magazines regularly. He also ha has been pu publishing uh, and participating in conferences, seminars, and panel discussions on strategic affairs at different universities, think tanks, and TV channels. He is also a distinguished senior fellow with Defense Research and Studies Institution. Welcome, sir. Welcome to the webinar. Uh, <clears throat> good evening, Anirudh, and good evening, everyone. I start by thanking CPPR, Dr. Dhanraj, Ms. Sharan, Mr. Anurudh, and all other colleagues in CPPR for giving me this opportunity to discuss this important issue. Um, Sir, uh, I, I'll first uh, discuss the topic today, give them a premise of what test we're going to do, then we'll look, go into this. Uh, please go ahead. So the topic of discussion today is on the Chinese Communist Party's 20th National Congress, which is going to be held from 16th October. 2, uh, 296 delegates have been carefully selected by party central leadership from party units at the provincial level and below, beside representatives from the People's Liberation Army and other similar important bodies who will attend the once in five years meeting. The one week long meeting will review the report on work done during the past five years and it will lay down the policies for the upcoming five years and beyond. The election of the new, new leadership is the main agenda of the meeting for the next five years, for the party meeting of next five years that includes central committee and will also be held during the meeting. The central committee will be subsequently and choose all the powerful Politburo and standing committee members. The new government that will be sworn in March 2023 at the 14th National Populist Congress will be more of a less, more or less a, a mirror image of the new leadership chosen during the party congress. There is a speculation on right that is that the conference also would mark the unopposed third tenure of Xi Jinping as the head of the party as well as the state. It is expected that the congress will look into the situation of the suffering Chinese economy along with planning the strategy for achieving the Chinese dream. CPPR is hosting this webinar to invite attention to the implications that the Congress can create for the greater China vision 
as well as to discuss the subsequent changes in the reform of the Chinese government. Now I request Mr. Murli Dhan Nair to take over the proceedings. I'm sorry, sir. You're on mute. <clears throat> sorry. Uh, good evening, uh, uh, Anil, and good evening, all participants. I missed uh, most of most of the introductory part by Anurudh because there is some sound issue I am I'm facing here. Maybe it's my side or your side. I don't know. Uh, I hope I am audible to you. Uh, is it is it okay, Anurudh? Yes, sir. Now you are completely audible. Okay. Please so um, I will not repeat the introductory part, though I would have uh, wished to do that. But I already know what he, he might have said. So normally I start by uh, building up the case of my argument, but this time uh, we don't have time. It's a very, very large subject. So I will go straight into the uh, topic. Uh, as uh, Anirudh just mentioned, the Chinese Communist Party is uh, holding its uh, 20th National Congress. We'll call it the Party Congress for ease of understanding from the 16th of October. So I think uh, nearly 2,300 uh, delegates from all over China <clears throat> uh, will attend the conference. To be precise, I think according to the list published uh, by Chinese media, <clears throat> it will be around uh, 2,296 delegates who would be participating in uh, uh, this year's party congress. Uh, these delegates come from uh, all over China, from uh, provincial level to maybe some people from below the provincial level, but they are not, they are elected for technical purposes, but they are actually selected carefully by the central leadership and the provinces or units below it, or the army, the, the public security bureau, the pub, people's um, armed police, uh, science and technology institution, they are all asked to select these people according to their merits. I don't say they are selected all are psychophants of uh, Xi Jinping. No, there are people who are really uh, merited in their own uh, field. So this uh, happens every five years. The West uh, would like to call it uh, one uh, twice in a decade conference. And the conference will review the work done by the government that is on behalf of the party during the past five years. It will also lay down policies and uh, other um, uh, plans for the coming next year. Importantly, it selects the next uh, leadership of the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, that will be uh, a, actually a central, a central committee. Uh, this time, uh, the Chinese Communist Party Central Committee has uh, 376 members, out of which uh, 205 are regular members and 171 are uh, alternate members. I'm not going into the uh, details of the difference. It's mostly in the seating. And when a regular member retires, somebody from the uh, alternate uh, member group is selected according to his seniority. And this Central Committee selects the all-powerful uh, Politburo. Now it has 25 members. And the, the, the Central Committee itself will select the uh, Standing Committee of the Politburo. Some media in India and abroad claim that it is the Politburo that selects the Central Committee. Actually, in reality, it is the Central Committee that selects the Politburo Standing Committee. As Anirudh just mentioned, it's it's important, the selection of leaders are important internationally because uh, these are the leaders who are going to occupy the um, seats of power in the government in March uh, 2023, when the 14 NPC, this is the National Congress of the party, NPC is the parliament, National People's Congress is going to convene, as I said, in March 2023. This will have a balance of all groups and factions Anirudh wanted me to speak on the factions also, I presume. 
uh, so I will not go into go the in the detail into this at this juncture. And he very correctly said that the general belief uh, in China and abroad is that Xi Jinping will get a third term, unprecedented third term is a uh, is a usage everybody is using these days, because uh, after Jiang Zemin or after Mao. No other leader became uh, a, a, a general secretary of the party for a third time. There are reasons to that. That will come uh, very, very soon. Will come to that point. So, by virtue of being the general secretary for a third time, Xi Jinping will also become the third, uh, the president of the country for a third time. In fact, there were restrictions put, or there was a term limit. No, no Chinese leader can become a president or a prime minister of the country for a third time, successive time. But this has been done away with. I think we'll uh, uh, discuss uh, briefly about that uh, very soon. And uh, people across the world, observers particularly, are keen to know who will be the sixth generation leaders. Uh, Xi Jinping is from the fifth uh, generation. So um, that will be an interesting thing, but uh, we will not go into so many names that will all be confusing to a person who is not very uh, familiar with Chinese affairs on a regular basis. So who is Xi Jinping? I will start by asking this question. Uh, besides being the general secretary of the Communist Party for 10 years and the president of the country again for 10 years, he is uh, the, the chairman of the Central Military Commission uh, the only civilian in the Central Military Commission. Others are all generals, mostly from theater commands and other uh, senior level of commands in the in the uh, PLA. Uh, he is the son of uh, Shi Chungshun, who was uh, purged by Mao. He was a minister in Mao's uh, uh, state council. They went on to become uh, vice premier later on. So he has that background. Uh, I think we will also discuss about this aspect a little bit uh, in detail later. Uh, before that, we will uh, uh, go into, uh, we'll have a peek at the Chinese history for, uh, during the post Mao period, or maybe just before that in 1945, Mao got an historical resolution passed in the party that is before the People's Republic was established. They don't call independent, they call it liberation because ba basically after uh, the war with Japan, it is with the Kuomintang, that's another Chinese uh, party, with which uh, the Communist Party fought and won the war and the Kuomintang fled to Taiwan. We all know that. Then he became so powerful, Mao, that uh, he assumed all powers, he introduced uh, collectivization of the land, form communes. It killed the enter, uh, enterprise of the farmers. Uh, why should people work for the government if they have, there are no incentives? Because there was this iron golden uh, uh, theory at that time where everybody contributes to the iron gold and you get what you uh, require according to your need. So it killed the enter, enterprise of the Chinese people, especially the farmers. Then uh, he uh, started something called the Great uh, Leap Forward, that is the industrialization of the of the uh, Chinese uh, nation. Uh, in fact, during that period, he, he fell out uh, with the Chinese, uh, sorry, the Soviet Russian leaders. So they stopped uh, supplying any heavy machinery and uh, also a technical know-how. So Mao, by mistake, we all know that he asked uh, the farmers to start uh, furnaces for smelting or uh, making steel in their backyards and agriculture fields. It became another fiasco because there was no fuel other than firewoods they could gather by themselves. And they had to throw in their utensils and uh, farm implements to meet the target set for them by the a local party secretary and people had no time to cultivate anything and it led to a big farm famine uh, and uh, i think uh, the, the the conservative estimates 
by Chinese scholars now is that at least 3.5 crore people have died in the in that man-made uh, famine. Anyway, then Mao launched something called uh, GPCR, the Great uh, Proletarian Culture Revolution. He, the main aim was, uh, you know, where he had very lofty ideas, but he intended to purge his uh, uh, enemies in the party by that. Uh, the, the people who suffered were Lin Piao, who later died in an air crash, then Liu Shaoqi, He Lung. He Lung died of uh, excessive glucose injected into his body. He was a, a highly diabetic patient. Then Peng Da Huai, Chu the Peng Chen, uh, then Xi uh, Qing's own father, Xi Chung Chen. These are only a few names um, that I come to uh, my mind uh, at this juncture. So having undergone this uh, uh, persecution by Mao, after his death, Deng Xiaoping ensured that this will not happen in China again. So he introduced uh, a system of collective leadership in the party. And uh, he, while picking up Chiang Semin to head the party and the government in 1989 after the Tiananmen Square uh, uh, massacre, uh, I dare say you <laughs> use that term massacre. Um, then we don't know how many people really died in that massacre. Uh, in fact, students. Uh, then she, Teng Xiaoping said that such a system of collective leadership uh, of leaders from various groups, interest groups, factions, then if the main leader tries to go astray, others can pull him back. Onto the, uh, onto, onto the track. Uh, this was uh, implemented, institutionalized in the Communist Party in the 80s. Chiang Semin, Hu Chindao, uh, 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 then Wan Chia Pao, then uh, Li Keqiang, they are all beneficiaries of this uh, system. And he put a two term limit uh, for the president and uh, premier of the government. Uh, and you know, they are leaders, number one, number two in the party. And he also made sure that towards the end, uh, rather at the beginning of the second term of these uh, leaders, president and the premier, they will introduce uh, a vice president and a vice premier, a youngsters, uh, smart people uh, who can take over from them when the leader completes the second term. So. Now, after Xi Jinping came, he uh, so he came in uh, 2012 as the general secretary. Then he became the party, uh, sorry, the president of the country in 2013. He made a lot of leading groups and commissions and tried to control everything under the sun in China, in the party as well as in the government. And um, uh, he's, uh, you know, he got a nickname called the chairman of everything because he controlled everything in China. Uh, he even controlled uh, economic affairs in the country. Uh, so he became, uh, or he got the title of a core leader, a, a, a title only Mao and uh, Teng Xiaoping held uh, uh, during their, their, their tenure. Uh, then uh, Mao held, uh, uh, you know, he had his thought, Mao's thought are very famous. Uh, then, uh, Teng Xiaoping had his thought. They were all enshrined in the constitution, the charter of the party, and later in the constitution of the government uh, with their names attached to it. We may uh, think that what is so important about the names being attached to some, or your ideology or your theory, uh, this is very important from a China point of view. Uh, Xi Jinping, uh, Chiang Zemin and who also had their uh, thoughts or theories uh, enshrined in the party charter and uh, in the uh, nation's constitution in a limited way without attaching their names to that. Whereas in the case of Xi Jinping, he had his uh, way and he got his name attached uh, to his uh, uh, socialist, uh, his thought for socialist, uh, new socialist era, to be very precise. So he is looking at things which only Mao and Deng had, and probably he wants to um, go 
uh, sidelined uh, Deng Xiaoping and come right at par with Mao. So now um, he is looking at the title of uh, uh, chairman of the party. Uh, we what we have to know is at the, in this uh, party congress is that whether he will become the chairman of the party or not. This is a title again held by the party. Uh, here I will uh, you know uh, I, I request you to recollect what I said that in 1945 Mao got a historic revolution, uh, a historical revolution passed in the party uh, that was aimed at uh, purging his. Uh, 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 opponent in the party and Teng Xiaoping did that in 1981. Uh, that is primarily aimed at um, uh, pointing out Mao's uh, mistakes officially in after two official reviews and he wanted to strengthen or an, a, 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 a renewed endorsement for his uh, uh, opening up and uh, uh, reform uh, policy. So Xi Jinping says that Mao's uh, thoughts were for liberating the party, it contained a lot of ideology, Teng was for reform, Xiang Semin and Hu's was for development, and Xi's I, uh, you know, ideas are for the future, that is for in past their resolution, historical revolution, uh, like uh, Mao and Teng. So this is to ensure that nobody questions him in the party. He also injected, I'm just uh, speeding up my um, pace, a little bit to cover as many points as possible. Uh, so uh, to come to a conclusion that uh, on this aspect, that in one sweep he got about uh, this collective leadership, which was enshrined in the uh, Communist Party uh, ethos. And uh, now if she think he can get the title of, because he's fond of titles, he can become the chairman of the CCP. He may not like to be the chairman of the of the country as such, because president, being a president, he gets a lot of privilege uh, wherever he might be traveling around uh, in the future. Uh, so he will, uh, will he become the chairman of the party is one thing uh, which we have to be uh, looking at in the in the party in the party congress now uh, i was told to uh, talk briefly about the fascism in the communist party um, the, the, so i won't go uh, to the past history in the recent history we all know about shanghai click uh, chiang samin was a, a, a main a proponent of the shanghai click or a leader of the shanghai click uh, shanghai click doesn't mean that they all hail from shanghai actually what happens is that these people work, would have worked in Shanghai, would have born in Shanghai, we don't know. Chiang Samin himself was not born in Shanghai. He was from the neighboring Chiangsu province. So they help each other in career uh, progression, uh, you know, plum postings, uh, place their people in key positions and all to control uh, the party uh, from within. The other group is Tuan Pai or uh, Youth League, uh, Hu Qingdao is from the Ryu thing. Ryu thing is like our DYFI or, or uh, Youth Congress or Yuva Morcha, people who work as youngsters in the party. Um, so they are very, they were very powerful till Hu Qingdao was uh, uh, the pre president of the country and the party secretary. And the uh, next uh, big group is the princelings or the red princes. Uh, some people would like to call them that way. These are a group of, a large group of youngsters, uh, sons, daughters, nephews, nieces of big, big time party leaders. Uh, they all came up in the late, towards the end of 70s and in the 80s, they all became. Xi Jinping, as I said, his father was a vice premier. He was one of them. Uh, so he is a ruthless person uh, so far as uh, uh, his power uh, designs are concerned. So he even, uh, you know, sent the people from his own group to, uh, there's no group as such, this is a misnomer actually. Uh, it's a collective, they help each other without uh, forming a formal group and all. 
So even I, the name that comes to my mind is that of Poshila. His father was uh, Poipo, another great leader at the level of uh, Mao Zedong. Um, so he was, um, uh, he's, uh, you know, he, he's uh, in the jail now for the, I think uh, some seven years ago, maybe eight, nine years ago, I can't recollect the exact date. He was sent to jail because his wife committed uh, uh, was party to a murder of a British uh, businessman. So um, he is very ruthless that way. So he played his cards very well and is um, managing things very well. And uh, now comes the question of um, uh, age relaxation. Um, age relaxation means Chinese have a saying that eight up and seven down. Uh, 67 down, you can, uh, you know, be at the higher excellence in the party and the government uh, as, a, as a minister. Government servants normally retire at 60. I think women retire at 55, uh, the ladies. Uh, so even he gave relaxation to somebody called Wang Chishan, who is the vice president, who helped him in the fight against uh, uh, corruption. Uh, uh, Xi Jinping's uh, most famous... Uh, 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 the fight against uh, tigers and flies. That's what he called big time people as well as small people. He, uh, even his all opponents uh, who threatened him were sent to jail under uh, this particular anti anti corruption drive. Uh, now, if uh, see uh, the current premier Li Keqiang is 67 years old. So he's due for retirement now. So he could have continued because he was only 67, but he will be completing his second term in, in, in March next year. So most probably he will, we will get a new premier in China. Uh, now who will become the new premier? Li Keqiang fell out with uh, Xi Jinping in recent times. There were a couple of statements. Uh, so probably he made a, uh, a statement to some friends that he may like to retire after he completes his second day. We don't know. But to balance the equation, he is from the from the Thuan Pai, the youth league group. So he may be made uh, president of the CPPCC or NPC. CPPCC is the Chinese People's Political Consultative Conference, which is an advisory body, which has uh, party members, uh, uh, then the, there are a few registered uh, uh, political parties in China whose job is to help the Communist Party in uh, nation building. And the businessmen, Thai, according to them, they're friends from Hong Kong, Taiwan, they will not be in the CPPCC. So he may be made to share that. So the current chairman of the CPPCC is Wang Yang. Uh, he is a Politburo standing committee member. He is also 67. It's a pro-reformer, probably in an era when Xi Jinping is looking at uh, introducing more, uh, uh, you know, uh, he's moving away from reform, according to some observers. Uh, otherwise, uh, Wang Yang holds a, a good chance to become the next premier. He was also a vice premier. In China, all premiers would have worked as well. Uh, vice premier at least for one term and there are people i don't want to you know reel out names uh, i always thought that hu chunhua is a new leader he is in the politburo but he is close to hu chindao in the youth link uh, he is only 59 years old so if wang yang comes we can draw a conclusion that xi jinping may continue for another 10 years after the next five that is another 10 years if he brings in Hu Chunhua, who is a youngster, we can draw a conclusion that uh, maybe he may step down after five years. They are all very long shots. Very, we cannot make any any prediction very very clearly at this juncture. And one person I would like everybody to know, along with the Changin Mayor, who is the Chongqing uh, Party Secretary, then uh, Tsai Chi is the Beijing Party. Communist uh, secretary, Li Shi is there. Then Ting Shui Xiang is some something like a secretary, a PA to um, a private secretary to. It's not a private secretary as such, but he behaves like that. 
so probably he may he may uh, get a good uh, promotion this time because obviously xi jinping is going to continue as a party secretary and the president so this gentleman may get a uh, good uh, assignment from xi this time uh, now i will quickly go into the uh, into the economy of chinese economy which is a very important thing we all talk about china be mainly because of its economy it got a powerful military because it has a stronger economy uh, and the second quarter of the chinese uh, econo gdp grew by a mere 0.4 percent uh, this time so which is a very very small number uh, which must be threatening the chinese leadership because and uh, annual growth is uh, now uh people say that it may, people uh, exactly people the experts feel that it may hover around the 3% only some people say even less than 3% so if that happens uh, this may lead to a lot of uh job losses in china which xi uh, jinping or the communist party in leadership is very scared of they don't want people to come onto the street and uh, create uh, uh problems for that so i will quickly run through the other points i have it here uh, and china is currently in a transition mode from the old model of uh, investment production of uh, low end low value things which are exported and money is made they want to uh, lay emphasis on uh, on uh, domestic consumption uh, innovation and innovation based uh, high high end high tech uh, products then services industry uh, and of course as i said uh, domestic consumption uh, to uh, because that will be a sustainable model they are looking at they want to become a new germany that is their idea so chinese have claimed that they had eradicated uh, abject poverty uh, in the 100th year of uh, party's establishment 2021 Uh, yeah probably the standard of living of chinese people have gone up it's better than most countries or probably all countries in uh, south asia uh, but recently li keqiang the premier came with a shocking statement that uh, 60 million people are now living at an income of 140 dollars per month uh, and he said that with that money an average chinese cannot hire one single room in any chinese city and lead a normal life so he says that this is urban poverty which uh, of course their uh, per day income is over 3 dollars or 5 dollars so that doesn't matter uh, as far as statistics are concerned so he also said that before the pandemic uh, the abject poverty had come down but after the pandemic poverty has gone up again so he didn't elaborate on this but these are strong statements uh, which probably he was hinting at xi jinping should not clamp down on the private sector in china uh, i will come to the, the the size of the private sector which will be astonishing to people who are not used to uh, uh, chinese affairs so so <clears throat> sorry uh, then covid Xi Jinping introduced something called zero tolerance against uh, uh, against COVID. Uh, even if you look at China, any day for the past uh, three, three, two and a half years, at least uh, 60 million people in about 30 to 40 cities will either be partially or fully under lockdown. So this has created a lot of problem, lot job losses, social issues. so this is happening he is not going to uh, relax these uh, uh, restrictions on china when other people countries in the world have you know reconciled uh, with the existence of the of the covid virus and moved on opened their borders china is still in the process of slowly opening the borders they are trying it out in hong kong they always have this uh, um, you know pilot projects what uh, chinese call it feel the purple and cross the river just slowly moving in that direction so probably now that he stuck 
to this zero covid policy for the past 30 odd months he may not like to let it go now and if the pandemic you know most of the several a good number of the chinese people particularly the older people are not fully vaccinated so if they all catch covid he will be blamed so probably he may look at the party uh, to endorse that moment because they he needs an exit uh, uh, policy uh, I, I, so i will uh, go to the next subject uh, yeah that, before i go move on i'll briefly speak about the real estate sector in china uh, there is a bubble a huge number millions of millions yeah it's not a mistake millions of uh, uh, flats and uh, uh, shopping units sh- shop units are all lying empty there are no buyers and people still buy houses thinking that it's a better way of uh, investment in china there are very little scope for people investing in different instruments so so they generally go for a second house or even a third house the government tried to control this move uh, they, they they didn't want to go the uh, to, to the market becoming too hot uh, with the property prices but the fact remains that china's growth was boosted by the uh, real estate se- sector like several other economies in, in now the, a, a conservative estimate is that at least 25% of the chinese gdp uh, is uh, uh, supported by the by real estate sector and uh, this big companies we would have all read reports about big company like evergrand Uh, taking loan billions of dollars of loan to build uh, uh, flats and uh, shopping complexes unable to pay back and uh, going bust actually but uh, chinese government is very strong uh, i'll come to that before that let me say this that uh, uh, even these companies took money from people uh, as bonds loans uh, you know investments and they were unable to pay back them when the when this loan set set uh, matured so people came demonstrated so the chinese government is so powerful as i said a minute ago and they asked the central bank bank of china that the people's bank of china to intervene and salvage the situation for the time being if had it been in some other country you know we remember the 2007 8 uh, uh, property uh, cash which led to the banks going bust in in usa uh, leading to a great uh, recession sort of thing so china could survive it because they have the resilience all said and done the government has the power to control everything uh, because it's a one party rule and no questions asked even inside the uh, inside the country not only in the party uh, now tech companies we also also would have read about uh, you know chinese government clamping down on big companies like alibaba tencent the an group uh, tax you know ride hailing uh, services like tt uh, then meituan they all are big companies huge companies uh, and there are so many tuition apps like our baiju uh, who have become billionaires in a matter of a uh, few years Uh, exactly the same story as baiju they have tuition apps and preschool apps even some people in china refuse to uh, make a second child saying that we are we can't afford paying tuitions to our children everybody sends their children to tuition schools so this happened and uh, now they were all fined very heavily under procedural um, uh, you know discrepancies and uh, breaking laws bending laws and all what xi jinping wants is that these people should contribute they have made a lot of money now you contribute to the welfare of the people so he has come up with another catchy phrase called the common prosperity where tech companies are they you know they cannot fight with chinese the government or the party so they agree to contribute and things are now uh, peaceful these days but this led to loss of uh, confidence uh, in the private sector in china as well as the uh, outside world so uh, i don't know how things will turn out whether the party congress will uh, uh, you know lay down a new policy direction for this uh, particular sector uh, 
and uh, even the provinces we took huge loans to participate in 2008-9 a stimulus package of the uh, of the central government during the financial lockdown they are unable to repay the loan service the loan but chinese government as i said has a resilience to uh, control everything so i will quickly talk about the private sector which i promised a minute ago uh, the private sector in china contributes to 60 60 not 16 60 60% of the chinese economy and 50% of the listed companies are from the private sector among the unlisted companies it's 25% 80% 80% of the urban jobs are created in the private sector 70% of the new jobs in china are um, uh, provided by the private sector innovation china stresses too much on innovation because that is the way they want to uh, uh, country to progress that is innovation based uh, high tech manufacturing um, so 70% happens in the private sector 90 90% of the exports uh, happen from the private sector investment 70% 70 happens in the uh, in the private sector this is despite availability of a level playing ground for the private company because these people are so enterprising they know how to make money uh, so such a sector cannot be you know controlled and uh, they, they cannot kill the enterprise or kill the enterprise of this particular group uh, that's why li keqiang made a very very uh, controversial statement only recently saying that the uh, mighty rivers of yangtze and uh, huang he, huang he is the yellow river uh, cannot fly backward so in china they don't come up with uh, uh, criticism of their leaders but these are uh, good enough uh, reason and uh, well, there's an interesting i hope i am not uh, very slow uh, anirudh um, so the 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 uh, in fact employing one person by another person was almost a crime similar to 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 the uh, to treason in china during uh, after their liberation then in after the tiananmen massacre in 1989 the party issued a circular keep away these capitalists because along with the foreign investment chinese managed to invest i am not going uh, deep into that due to shortage of time so they they kept them away but this group grew so powerful so a pragmatic communist party leadership decided that let us control them by allow them allowing them membership into the party in the party so they became party members the, they felt that being a party member they can cut the lot of red tapes they have few red tapes in china in comparison to other countries in south asia and the way uh, they allowed these uh, private sector companies is um, you know by uh, uh, you know, they gave an ideological uh, justification saying that they are one of the three represents of the country i'm just literally translate translation translating it from chinese so they are one of the pillars main pillars of the chinese uh, uh, economy so they had uh, they endorsed party endorsed it uh, added in the party cha- cha- charter and again uh, it was uh, ended the constitution of the country also now i will look at people uh, anirudh how many minutes i have anirudh Uh, yes sir uh, how many minutes i have sir we are running a little bit short of time so if you could just pass it up so we can go to the question and sessions oh uh, okay then give me another 10 minutes please if you if you don't mind i will just uh, w- yes sir please pass oh, okay. okay the people uh, you know the chinese chinese government is very very uh, i will not go away. i had some interesting things about people uh, party relations but i will cut it short saying that the people feel that the party will take care of us uh, party feels that okay we will take care of you so you don't ask for freedom of expression democracy all these are uh, taboo in china we all know that so people are happy that the party will and to a great extent party has taken care of uh, the people's aspiration especially the young uh, people's uh, 
uh, aspirations. Um, and it's a pragmatic government, as I said, they change the hookah system. You know, Mao Zedong said that he will make a classless society, but immediately after taking over, he made two classes, China divided China into two classes. That is one is the urban population, the other is the rural population. The rural people could not go to uh, cities without registering them, having a card called hukou. So they are, you know, uh, liberalizing those policies. Again, one child policy, it's not that all of a sudden they removed it. They slowly uh, gave a lot of concessions in certain areas. So there are so many things. The party constantly monitors the people and they are actually ahead of the curve. If there is a problem, when the people come out with the problem, they are already ready with a solution. This is an amazing thing, actually. As I said, they should not ask for anything like uh, um, uh, democracy or freedom of expression. Now, another interesting point, uh, which is, um, uh, I will not claim any, any pattern to that, but I don't think anybody else has discussed this so far. It's a deduction I have made it. Recently, we heard about uh, some rumors about uh, some Xi Jinping being removed as the chairman of the, C uh, of the Central Military Commission. So I will not, if somebody asks me about that in the q and I will come to that. But definitely there is a simmering uh, discontent in the army's top echelon that uh, is civilian like Xi Jinping. He has an army background to an extent. He was uh, political commissars in, in Fujian or some other places, but he is not a regular army man. And they don't mind an army man sitting, but he is, uh, you know, he dismissed two generals as uh, CMC vice chairman. Amazing. Nobody had the guts to do that so far. He has removed so many generals, so many other uh, people. So, uh, to why I say that there is a simmering discontent, the resistance to. Uh, way of functioning as far as the PLA is concerned. The PLA daily carried a, uh, an article which was carried by other uh, newspapers in China, which uh, spoke, they, they keep saying that the PLA, the judiciary, the government, everything is answerable to the party. Uh, like in Pakistan, we say it's an army with a country, whereas in China, it's a party with a government, a party with a army and party with a judicial, a judicial system. So this particular article is eye-opening. It mentioned at more than around 30 times about the leadership of the party over the army. And it said that it, uh, Xi Jinping removed uh, two uh, generals as vice chairman. After that, uh, the, the CMC, the Central Military Commission is a better place to work with. He said that the army cadres are bricks, which the party would like to send them wherever it wants. And more seriously, it should say that it should say no to wrong orders. These are translations from the Chinese. So probably, you know, if the PLA daily carrying and other uh, articles, and this was unusually long, 7,000 word article, uh, repeatedly saying uh, about the superiority or the leadership role of the party. Definitely, uh, this is a major thing. Uh, where does the party go? How, do, how does it manage? How does, how does it keep going? You know, it's a major question. Because I went, happened to read a study where say that a single party rule cannot survive more than 70, 75 uh, years. Uh, by that time, it gets decayed, the leadership decays and all. But China has, uh, you know, proven that so many studies are not uh, stranglehold over the people. The, the leadership is pragmatic, pragmatic, uh, practical minded. They will listen. If the pressure comes, they will definitely bend the rules to admit their uh, demands. There is a strong result. This is very important. Strong result. Uh, as far as the party leaders are concerned, uh, not to let people starve or lose jobs. They don't want that to happen for two reasons. Once they, they have the welfare of the people in mind, there's no doubt about that. Secondly, they don't want people to come to the streets and see 
problem and they have as i said uh, address the aspirations of the people but wherever they they may compromise but wherever they need to they are very very and uh, i will talk a few more points and finish in another five minutes uh, xi jinping introduced china dream like the american dream so and he also spoke about the rejuvenation of the chinese nation this is the translation we get to read it but actually if you read the chinese it is the rejuvenation of the chinese race rse race this is important uh we don't expect that to come from a from a very modern progressive society so they feel that they were humiliated for 100 years uh, and uh, they they know that they will dis, uh, replace america as the number one economy and uh, they have a theory called tianxia uh, tianxia means under the uh, under the heaven that is heaven's mandate so the emperor in china had the heaven's mandate and uh, to rule the country Uh, and also the neighboring uh, you know areas like tibet mongolia etc and the name for china as we know is uh, in chinese is tungko tungko means middle kingdom so this is a cultural and over they still carry that this china is the center of the world the greatest culture in the world and they want to uh, reach the number one spot where it actually belong to in, before the humiliation by the foreign and started by the year 2049 when china will become a, a prosperous democratic even in inverted commas uh, from my side socialist uh, country by 2049 so before that they want to reclaim all the land they lost to foreign countries who have uh, grabbed their land during the past centuries that's why things are happening in south china sea east china sea and in the himalayas in the indian border also in bhutan and nepal so this will keep happening in my view um, so they they need friends they are uh, you know looking at uh, friends they i heard that they look for friends in, uh, to to form a anti west alliance meaning anti american alliance so um, uh, build a party be challenged after the uh, or during the party congress the leadership would be challenged i don't think so uh, but in no natural i feel that domestically at the party congress the party will move towards the left uh, they will may look at planned economy uh, to to enhance its role in the economy uh, the private sector might suffer i don't know uh, then internationally it will become it will turn towards the right it will be it will become more assertive uh, so will there be any change um, i think with regard to us i think they will grab on the nearest opportunity to mend the relations with the usa uh, and i think in bali uh, g20 i think anirudh is working on that Uh, they may have a meeting and maybe maybe they will do make some progress in mending their relation india has to be careful uh, of america i will always say that we need american presence in the indian indo pacific at the same time we should i wrote it 10 years ago in a, in a paper published in in a, in a in a book by kerala university that we should keep engaging with china because usa from its past its history uh we saw in india or any other country we cannot trust them fully but luckily we have a foreign minister uh um, who knows the real uh things as far as uh, foreign relations with all the all the countries are concerned and with russia they said it's a, a no limits uh, relationship but i think the limits of their relationship has already shown in the past uh, few weeks uh as i said they are they are looking for building an anti west block they will get support from so many uh areas in that uh, we saw what is hap- what happened in uh, south pacific i think we did a uh, webinar on that also so one keyword for, uh, for for from my side is continuity there may not be any major departure from its policies as far as uh, its domestic uh, uh, issues are concerned nor its uh, external uh, issues are concerned so thank you very much for your patience 
uh, i don't know whether i have done justice to uh, your time your patience so uh, let me uh, see whether there are any questions thank you thank you once more thank you sir thank you for such a insightful and well explained session sir uh, we have few q and a's so uh, due to the time constraints please pass through the questions which you have already answered so you want questions one by one or can i ask two to three and you'll clap yeah, yeah two to three and uh, i will be very brief yes yeah, sir please pass through the questions you have already uh, addressed through your question. okay i i will please go ahead yes sir sir first question is from mr kv thomas uh, sir uh, he is asking thank you for your comments on the present issues in cpc and dissidents against c it was it see during c is first term undertook radical anti graft moves particularly against the corrupt pl officials almost all the tigers and flies within the pla were purged out that being in the scenario in 2012 to 17 how can we interrupt so called dissidents against c from pla and cpc as recently propagated by different sources sir there is a one more question from mr kv thomas uh, so which says that what are the likely geo strategic fallout of the 20th congress party and 20th party congress and emergence of c again to chairman post within particular reference to india whether xi jinping's transformation from 2012 to 2022 from an understanding leader on world peace to an expansionist expansions and aggressive neo authoritarian in 2022 he is a threat to the world peace particularly in indo pacific uh, do i answer that now yes sir you answer this okay questions. i think uh, he is uh, yes answered the question himself uh, towards the end of the long question Uh, i don't fi- feel there will be any major change this have we india or uh, in the geo strategic uh, um, uh, what was that word used um, what in their policies i don't find any change happening because if you look at xi jinping he was the vice president and who chinta up to 5 years up to 2012 13 then he is ruling as president for the 10 for past 10 years so he 15 years he has been doing this and they have it's not only xi jinping we all criticize xi jinping as a tyrant or an authoritarian rule it is the parties he is a pawn in the hands of the party he has a style of working like in any other country um, the party has a um, you know policy of approaching things so he is also he is only executing it in a very authoritarian way that's why probably in my understanding uh, li keqiang the current premier was the favorite of uh, hu chintao the then president to become the uh, president of the country to succeed him but uh, you know, the party the elders that, at that time they had this uh, uh, collective leadership they decided that no for the party's next this particular stage of development The development is within uh, inverted commas. Uh, Xi Jinping would be the right choice. Uh, rather, as Li Keqiang would have been a more humane, and humane approach and all. So uh, that's it. So I don't, in in one word, uh, I don't see any major change in the Chinese policy in any area. That's why I ended the talk by saying that continuity is the key word uh, domestically as well as internationally. Thank you. next question uh, okay sir i'll just go on to the next question this yeah, is please. from mr gagan garo sir he has asked following the p- past practice xi jinping should have designated a successor in 2017 who would be groomed for the top position over next 5 years why is that we still don't have a name who will likely to succeed xi jinping and next uh, question is on what can the rejuvenation of chinese race mean for han chinese versus tibetans and uyghurs yeah i think uh, I, i answered the first part uh, in the talk so i yes, will sir. not uh, go over it again yes, uh, as, uh, yeah chinese race means it's a very broad subject so um, in fact uh, han chinese uh, it's a chinese race they said there's a chinese race they have in written han chinese but you are very right that 
what they have in mind is han chinese because han chinese is the when you talk to an average chinese they feel that they are the um, you know they have the the best culture the greatest culture uh, in the world that sort of thing they keep and so definitely the, the their um, policy towards uh, uyghurs and tibetans and mongols and they have 56 uh, uh, different uh, nationalities that is minority nationalities so the policy will continue and uh, han chinese will uh, you know rule supreme they have uh, you know they have uh, inducted han people uh, into xinjiang tibet mongolia and other places to ensure that uh, the han people rule china and these people will continue to be a, a weak uh, minority i think that is generally the answer thank you okay sir so next question is from the former ambassador to sudan mr sri kumar madam sir he has asked that in the context of sino indian ties it has been often said that engaging with a strong leadership in china to find a solution to the boundary dispute is a better proposition than struggling to find a solution under a weak chinese leadership how do you see this viewpoint sharing up in the light of president xi jinping consolidating his power base and becoming this Um, he, he, the ambassador is very right actually it's better in as far as uh, um, pakistan or china are concerned we sh- would be happy we should be happy to deal with a strong leadership so that decisions are taken whereas in china's case they have a plan for their border issue we are talking about the border issue they know they have decided how to resolve the border issue so for resolving the border issue they will go to any extent to uh, you know uh, forget about all these agreements we have signed uh, signed with the chinese leadership so i, I don't think uh, the chinese are any leader there is a weak leader or it is as i said in the in the answer to the last question it is a party that decides certain things definitely i also feel that uh, we should have a strong leader a leader to leader but see how they came right up to our border uh, rather the bhutanese border uh, in 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 uh, doklam then what happened in uh, eastern ladakh these are all signs that the, a strong leader can do more harm if that leader is from the chinese side so um, i think uh, uh, we have a strong uh, foreign minister uh, at this moment I was uh, my ambassador in in Beijing at that time I was in Guangzhou at that time so I think um, we can come out with any proposition but chinese will will agree to an agreement under a given take policy only chinese had made offer of a, a give and take that is barter deal keep arunachal and it gave us uh, uh, eastern ladakh but this has been happening this has happened many times but chinese want to strengthen their argument by uh, not uh, by raising new 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 uh, claims and uh, new friction points so i think um, probably they want to uh, have a peaceful border for some time it doesn't mean that no frictions will happen in between but at least now that they have agreed that indians will not patrol a particular area neither will they do that so our uh, possibility of trying to construct in a defenses other defense infrastructure uh, inside that area which we claim which is ours actually but the chinese say that it is theirs so probably they have achieved their uh, um, uh, their interim policy of stopping india now we won't go to you know in the uh, petrol uh, in the finger points we don't we used to at least in theory go to uh, finger eight chinese used to stop us as soon as they come to know about it now we are not going technically so we have gone back to our original uh, place uh, beyond uh, rather behind uh, finger one so uh, let us see I, uh, frankly speaking none of our experts at all levels um, has been able to 
handle China. So I also consider myself as one among them, not an expert though, but uh, I don't think uh, how these things will, uh, uh, because Chinese have ulterior, when they do something, when they keep their right hand on a table, they, it has a meaning. They keep a ha left hand on the table, it has meaning. How we read it, how we analyze it, how we decode it, um, you know, this is uh, difficult sometimes. At least for a person like me, it's difficult. Thank you. Okay, sir. Then we have one more question, or not okay. two questions more. So this is from Mr. Gakin Sir, uh, do you think about Hu Chunha as a replacement for Li Kadai? Both are youth league faction member and whose bio type in favor of C. Showing that despite being from a different faction, he can be identified as a loyalist. Yeah, I think um, he, uh, I, what I heard initially 10 years ago that uh, Chiang Zemin was not very happy with uh, uh, Xi Jinping in certain matters, but he worked so hard. Uh, I'm uh, not Chiang Zemin, I beg your pardon, Ho Chin Tao, um, the then Prime Minister, but he's worked so hard and uh, convinced his uh, president, Ho Chin Tao, that he is a reliable man. So even if uh, Ho Chun Ha is uh, made the premier, I think uh, mm, uh, he can work hard and convince them. Uh, but the, whether Ho Chun Ha will become the premier now depends on the strength of the uh, prayer that uh, Thuan Pai, that is the youth league faction at this moment. So probably if Ho Chun Hua, as I said before, becomes the premier or is made the premier, which means that uh, Li Kechi, uh, sorry, Xi Jinping, Xi Jinping might retire after uh, 20, uh, what is that, uh, another five years. This five year is uh, given to him uh, in all, all, all probability. So after that, he because he has a new man, but then who will be whom who we have to see who he is going to make the vice president. That's very important. If he is getting a youngster and a youngster as the vice president, uh, who can uh, who can be ready to replace him replace him after five years? Then definitely Hu Chunghua stands a good stance because they this uh, Thuan Pai, the, the the youth league and uh, uh, princeling and they all have a balance. And when it comes to the, uh, the, the the national interest of the country, all these groups come together. They have it's unlike in some other parts of uh, South Asia. They all come together to make sure that the nation's interest, the party's interest, are are served. So let us see who will be the vice president, and who will be the premier or vice premier. So it's a very uh, difficult question to answer at this juncture. But as they call, we all do tea leaves reading. The Chinese, uh, the entire uh, observer community has started or have been doing tea leaves reading. That is Chinese uh, uh, of, uh, way of, uh, I don't know, astrological way of, uh, of forecasting things. So um, really, we don't know. But I feel that Ho Chunhua being a vice premier stands a good stance to come. But it all depends whether... Xi Jinping would like to replace Li Keqiang with um, Wang Yang or Billy. Uh, we, we really don't know. We have to wait and see. Okay, sir. Uh, now we have the final two questions. So with this, we can wind up. Sir, first is on, can you elaborate on your, give a small excerpt from your recently published article on the Chinese coup possibilities? And next question is on what do you think are the chances that Xi Jinping will institute the position of party chairman, which was once held by Mao Zedong, which would necessarily place him above the Politburo Standing Committee? Okay, I will answer the second question first. Yeah, there is a good chance that he may become, he may be given the title of, um, uh, uh, of the chairman of the party, uh, given his, uh, you know, thirst and um, hunger for titles, bigger titles, uh, to be considered at par with uh, Mao Zedong. Uh, so there is a possibility, but uh, we don't know how these senior leaders will uh, sit together and treat it. Actually, 
uh, decisions for the party um, are not taken exactly at the party congress most of the time it's all taken well in advance and they discuss and uh, give you an endorsement so uh, in my opinion there is a good chance i will not commit myself to that there is a good chance that uh, he may become the uh, he may be given the title of the party chairman he may be i will say 50 50 very safe way of uh, uh, making a for, forecast and regarding the recent coup uh, i think i have written an article published uh, uh, by cppr so there i will just take two minutes i don't want to hold up people for a long time uh, this uh, the, the videos we saw uh, are i don't think uh, they are not what they were claimed to be there were army column marching but we don't know when it was taken which point to which point the column was moving and the man says it was 80 km long column how do we say it by showing one video that it's 8 km was he present at both ends at the same time so i think uh, this are all uh, you know brought out initially by there is a group called falun gong uh, chinese observers will know that this is something like a you know semi spiritual exercise based group Uh, which was banned in china very powerful they have deep sources um, inside china so whatever they say uh, might turn out to be correct but they also do a lot of uh, 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 false propaganda they have a newspaper called uh, uh, epoch times they have also this new new i i forgot the name new thang tv station they all do anti china propaganda on a regular basis so uh, we really don't know and uh, firing is happening at an uh, airport again we don't know where, when this was shot maybe it was happening uh, at a firing drill or or a defensive drill the uh, uh, chinese air force was conducting against the background of uh, developments in taiwan american warnings and all so this could be same as that the sounds at the background can be a voice over that is uh, uh, added to the video later having said that i don't deny that these are all totally wrong we really don't know is the answer but in my view uh, uh, there are two three things which uh, really surprised me one is the chinese uh, are very sensitive to all allegations against them at especially allegations like this so why did the chinese government come out in the open and deny if not condemn these uh, uh, allegations probably they felt that keeping silence is the best form of uh, ignoring these uh, messages and uh, she ching would have gone into hiding uh, after coming back from uh, from from uh, samarkand in after the sio meeting whether he left early we don't know whether this was planned that way maybe he had some commitments then we didn't know that like he, before the uh, start of the covid he was in myanmar he came back went for a short trip inspection trip of yunnan then he disappeared for a long period so maybe he scared of uh, i don't know uh, of uh, covid so he, uh, he was being extra extra careful uh, but he has reappeared but removing xi jinping that is the core of my argument uh, from the cmc chairmanship is a difficult thing there is a simmering discontent as i said that but he cannot be deposed from the chairmanship post uh, all of a sudden and what happens to the other post he is holding if if it's a coup he will be removed from all positions and it will be declared and uh, of course there are reports about uh, flights being cancelled high speed uh, trains being cancelled that but what happened to the stock market the stock market in china is stock market works on sentiment if this rumor was true something would have would have happened in the stock market there would have been a, a sudden collapse or something so i still believe that this is a rumor uh, but having said that uh, you know i told you about that article which came in uh, the peep, uh, the the chefang uh, the, the the liberation army daily that uh, 
the army should be this is standard thing to tell the army even the judiciary that you are subservient to the party but the language the tone tenor the number of times uh, they repeated about the uh, leadership of role of the party over the army uh, these all indicate that there is a problem going on in china with the leadership but uh, xi jinping and any chinese leader for that matter or any other leader anywhere in in, in a country like uh, authoritarian rule they promote their own people people trustworthy their own loyalists to key positions so even if a general in a, you know if a tier command turns out he can uh, do a coup there is no doubt about that but he if he does he, he enacts a coup even a, a captain uh, 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 level officer has uh, uh, enacted coup in so many countries but whether they will be able to hold on to that uh, you know uh, that is a major issue so i don't think uh the 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 uh, and beijing and uh, the the herpai they are from different one is from central military command theater command and one from the beijing is from the northern uh, theater command so these are major issues they cannot uh, in act a coup without taking the other theater command into confidence so let us uh, consider it as a coup uh, definitely i can from my little reading that there is a discontent among the top excellence of the of the communist party uh, the pla against xi jinping's activities if their anxiety is their worries are addressed they may also fall in line and uh, uh, do uh, xi's bidding but it may not make any difference to india or their policy in tibet or thaiwa no that is a different thing when it comes to their national interest everybody is united so we it, it really uh, i don't think uh, anything major has happened maybe some minor things would have happened uh, that is why precisely uh, after the rumors floated this particular set of articles had come in chinese newspapers i i don't know whether i have answered that question thank you thank you for answering the all questions in very brief sir for further uh, clarification i have actually attached the link of the article you have recently published on the coping oh, china you. in the chat yeah. column so that people can get read and clarify uh, their doubts uh, one more one more thing anil i have published an article in madhubhumi weekly okay sir uh, uh, the current week uh, that is date lined uh, i think uh, uh, 9th of october but it is already in the stands this is again it's a 14 page article very elaborate article in malayalam very simple language for the ordinary leader uh, reader so if anyone is interested in more, knowing more about the 14th uh, sorry the 20th uh, party congress uh, please go through the article and uh, cppr has my uh, email address if anybody has a genuine Uh, uh question to ask me they are always welcome to ask me uh, if i don't know anything i on that particular answer i will refer to or discuss with friends and come back to you in a reasonable uh, period of time so thank you once again uh, and thanks to you anirudh sharan both of you have worked so hard for this i know uh, thank you i only wish that i have done justice to your efforts and the patience of my listeners thank you so actually thank you for such a insightful session so you you were engaging our minds for the past hour or so taking us through the insights of the 20th ccp and its influence on chinese governance and the next strategy for the upcoming decade actually it was an honor to host you in this evening and i would also want to thank all the participants for logging in and listening so intently for your questions and at cbbr we look forward for much of such a fruitful engagement with you all through our webinars and conferences please follow our website and social media pages for up to further updates with this i would like to formally close today's proceedings wishing you all a very lovely evening and a great week ahead thank you thank you sir thank you thank you thank you everyone i'm leaving yes sir thank you